Good afternoon and uh, welcome to our first Edington Fellow Lecture of 2021 and our first virtual Edington Fellow Lecture ever. And so we're delighted to welcome those of you who may be joining us for the first time. Today's speaker is Dr. Fred Woods, Professor of Religious Education at Brigham Young University. In 2019, he was appointed to a BYU Endowed Moral Education Professorship. And he's also a senior associate of Pembroke College at the University of Oxford. His talk today is entitled Bright Lights in the Desert, the Latter-day Saints of Las Vegas. And please note that this lecture is being recorded and we will take questions via chat following the lecture. Okay, we had a little technical difficulty. First of all, I want to thank Sue Kim for her introduction. She's been such a delight to work with and uh, so great to be with you today. Bright Lights in the Desert, the Latter-day Saints of Las Vegas. And I want to dedicate this lecture to two couples. The first, Albert and Mary Edwards, who compiled, preserved, and nurtured Nevada history. I've been leaning heavily uh, for some time in 2020 on the Albert Edwards collection at the UNLV Lead Library Special Collections. And 30 years ago, uh, Mary Edwards delivered up her husband's papers. And uh, this has just been a jewel to work with. I also want to note that she was uh, named Nevada Mother of the Year. And so this is a dynamic couple as are David and Jana Dixon, who have been dear friends of my wife and I for the past 40 years. And so I've known there were good people in Vegas for uh, some time. The Dixons, five boys, 15 grandchildren. Jana was also named Nevada Mother of the Year in 2018. And uh, they are a great model of uh, what a Latter-day Saint should, uh, should be. I want to thank both Peter Michelle, Director of UNLV Special Collections, and Sue Kim, Head of Special Collections Public, Public Services for all their support during this, particularly during this time of the Edington uh, Research Fellowship, and other workers, Aaron, Sarah, and Cindy for their assistance, and also the Center for Gaming Research, which sponsors the Edington Research Fellowship. And just as a footnote, I thought the title of my first book on Las Vegas, A Gamble in the Desert, fit in quite nicely with the, uh, with the name of the center. So today, in a, just a 40-minute uh, zip, I'm going to take you, uh, I'm going to move quickly through uh, the old Mormon fort in Las Vegas and take you up to the time of the, uh, to the Las Vegas temple. And just highlight, particularly, I'll be hitting on different uh, salient, salient features of history, but particularly wanting to emphasize the influence the Latter-day Saints have had in the Las Vegas metro area. And uh, I also want to make it very clear that I don't think they're the, other, the only ones that are doing great things in Las Vegas. Uh, having lived here the last month, uh, what I've, just my wife and I have both commented about what a 
a beautiful area and uh, gracious, beautiful people are here. So let's begin with uh, that gamble in the desert. What was Brigham Young's gamble as we go back to 1855? <clears throat> Sending missionaries, Latter-day Saint missionaries to establish a fort in Vegas, 450 miles from Salt Lake City amid poor soil, unpredict unpredictable Paiutes, and where some might say it was so dry that the lizards were wearing canteens at, at the dawn of summer. Why did he want to accomplish, why did, what did he want to accomplish with this fort? Well, he wanted to launch a mission to the local Native Americans, as well as keep the Mormon corridor safe for immigrants and for the mail. So you might ask, what was the Mormon corridor? Well, it was a path that ran about where I-15 runs today from Salt Lake City all the way down to the coast here where um, Southern California, where I grew up. <clears throat> Brigham Young was very gifted at uh, colonization. He established 350 colonies uh, during a 30 year period from 1847 to 1877, of which 86% have proven to be successful. Why was the plan effective, we might ask? Because he sent out scouts before settlement and, and reports were given to him regarding the area. Leaders were then selected and skilled people were called to the colonies. And in the spring of 1855, 30 men were sent to Las Vegas and others would follow. These were men that were prepared. John Steele, one of the 30, said they were first-rate first men. According to, to Steele, the missionaries called were mostly, quote, mostly young men, and many of them I had been before associated with both in the Mormon battalion and elsewhere, a first-rate set of boys. For those not familiar with Mormon battalion, this was a group uh, of uh, 500 volunteers who served in the military from July of 1846 to July of 1847 during what, during the Mexican-American War. Some of those selected had unique gifts. One was George Bean, who because of having an arm blown off by a cannon that misfired, spent time among Native Americans in the Utah region and learned various Native American languages. He was assigned as mission clerk at the, the old Las Vegas mission. And he also wrote the official mission history and kept a personal journal as well. From various entries, daily entries, we know it took five weeks to travel the route from uh, Salt Lake to Vegas. And we know they arrived, the first group, on June 14th of 1855. Just a few days later, they were already laying out the fort, 150 feet square, and farming. Uh, etc., clearing off and planting their gardens, as we know from the official church record that he kept. John Steele <clears throat> uh, drew this hand drawn map and uh, kind of showing where the fort was and the, the region where they laid things out, including the original gardens and the corral and the adobes. The leader of the mission was William Bringhurst. Who there, and there was a correspondence going on continually with President Brigham Young, and that cache of letters is very valuable for primary resources. And one letter that was later published in the Latter-day Saint periodical, The Deseret News, Bringhurst wrote, wrote to Young, shortly after he arrived here, we assembled all the chiefs and made an agreeable treaty with them for permission to make a settlement on their lands. We agreed to treat them well, and they were to observe the same conduct towards us and with all white men. Peace was to be preserved with all the immigrants traveling through this country as well as the settlers. And as I mentioned earlier, their, their primary mission was to, do, um, to work with the Native Americans, both in helping them to prepare gardens, but also to teach them um, 
principles of spiritual salvation. Here's a wonderful image that we have in the late 19th century of a Latter-day Saint missionary baptizing a local Native American in the St. George area. And we have this note by Bringhurst that on this particular day <clears throat> uh, in November, early November of 1855, they had baptized 60 or 56 local uh, Native Americans. We also know though that the mission didn't last long, just about two years. And there was uh, also a plan not only to teach the Native Americans and to protect the Mormon corridor, but also to be involved with mining. And there were some misunderstandings, some power struggle between uh, Nathaniel Jones, who led the mining group and also Bringhurst. And eventually the mission was closed uh, with another important external factor of having 2,500 military men coming into to, uh, the area, what, what was came to be known as the Utah War. Uh, or also known as President Buchanan's blunder, as they wanted to displace Brigham Young as governor and to put in a new governor, feeling like he had too much power in the territory. After it closed down, though, we know that Albert Knapp, one of the first 30 missionaries sent to Vegas, he came back to the, to the fort a few years later and was involved with selling goods to the local miners in the area and then later his brother William came along and service passing wagon, wagon trains. Latter-day Saints eventually left the area at this time, but the fort remained an important part of the Las Vegas history and was preserved largely through the efforts of the daughters of the Utah pioneers who were very persistent. The DUP as they're known is attested 650 times and the RJ and the title Mormon Fort occurs nearly 1,800 times in the review journal uh, for an average of 20 times per year. So you see that continually in the mind's eye of the Vegas community in the 20th century and into the 21st century, the importance of the Latter-day Saints as the first white settlers in the area who left their mark and have this at the Old Mormon Fort, this is the oldest standing building in uh, Nevada. Now moving ahead several decades, we have the first branch of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints uh, launched in 1915. Newell K. Levitt began working for the Clark Ford Fording Company in 1912 as a clerk and also delivered goods to customers in the Vegas area. And while working in the store and on deliveries, he probed to see if there were other Latter-day Saints in the area that were, that were who were customers. After collecting names, Newell started a Sunday school in his home, which eventually became a Latter-day Saint branch in 1950 with Charles Renault, a business partner with Clark, who is the presiding officer. We also know from early records that by 1923, the Latter-day Saints met in a dance hall above Beckley's clothing store located at First and Fremont Streets where the Pioneer Club now stands. Notice also as I'm moving through this quickly, how many of these images are from UNLV Special Collections and Archives, particularly the Albert Edwards Collection. The first Las Vegas ward, which would be like the equivalent uh, to a Catholic as a parish, and later I'll talk about a stake that would be like a diocese. The, the first Las Vegas congregation or ward was organized at a stake conference held in June, 1924 in Overton with Ira J. Earl as the first bishop who later became served as a Clark County commissioner. And by 1925, there was a small frame Latter-day Saint chapel built on the Northwest corner of Sixth and Carson. Two years later, we find this wonderful image again in the Edwards collection of the Latter-day Saints Sunday School taken here at the county courthouse. In this same year, we find the first Latter-day Saint Las Vegas Scout Troop was created, Troop Number 63, with Marion B. Earl as the first Scoutmaster. 
And just as a footnote, I would point out that for nearly a century, Latter-day Saints have been a tremendous blessing to the Las Vegas community. One who's been heavily involved in the, in the scouting program is local LDS attorney and scout administrator, William Stoddard, who noted in a recent interview, if you looked at the members of the church and their involvement in the Boy Scouts here in the Las Vegas area and Clark County or Southern Nevada, frankly, the church has been the backbone of scouting. Stoddard was recently called as the new Las Vegas Nevada Temple president and would begin that assignment in the fall of 2021. Moving ahead from the 27 scouting uh, period when it was launched three years later, you can get a feel here of the demographics where the church is now 410 members out of 5,000. And I thought that uh, this postcard dated to 1930 is helpful because it reveals that the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints was great, was gaining greater visibility. And we also get a sense that it was 8% of the population. This again from the lead library, special collections and archives. During this <clears throat> same period, the, the Mormon Fort and the Hoover Dam, we have this connection. We know the Hoover Dam, they start erecting it in 31. And we know that at the Mormon Fort site, it played a part in the construction of the Hoover Dam when the Bureau of Reclamation leased the Adobe building and uh, used it as a concrete testing laboratory. We had a number of Latter-day Saints among people of different cultures and faith who worked on the dam. One was Glenn White, who drove his Model A from Vegas to Boulder, where he worked for three years. He writes that he had a contract to unload all the cement that went into the dam. They ran their shifts that paid us $6 per day. This was big money at the time. We worked eight hours per day, seven days a week, hard work. There were four men to the shift. The men would unload 10 train car loads of cement in eight hours. Um, again, as a footnote, this is uh, Jana Dixon's um, great-grandfather, her grandfather, I should say, Wendell, her father. And we also find at the time at the conclusion of the Hoover Dam that the, that the Mormon Tabernacle Choir, now known as the Tab Tabernacle Choir at Temple Square, performed at Hoover Dam on the return from the World's Fair in San Diego. We have some wonderful images there. The church began to have exposure, uh, the exposure increased with the appointment of U.S. Senator Berkeley Bunker, who is also a local church leader in this region. <clears throat> in one source, Bunker noted, Las Vegas has been very good and kind to the Mormon people. We have grown and thrived and lived as good neighbors to the Catholics and Jews and Protestants and all denominations without ever a rift. I, I also wanted to point out as an aside that I found it very interesting that I did not find any anti-Mormon or Latter-day Saint literature in the local Las Vegas newspapers until the late 1970s, which is quite unusual for a, um, a city that's the size of Vegas. Moving on to World War II, there was Latter-day Saint activity that was going on with their support of the soldiers, both overseas as well as in their local area. And by this time, the population of Las Vegas was about 30,000 with 10% uh, being Latter-day Saints. The church continued to grow. By 1954, Las Vegas had its own stake, which is like I said, like a diocese of several thousand members. And in 1960, the North Las Vegas stake was created. 60 years later, we now have 27 stakes in the Las Vegas metro area, a stake averaging about 4,000 members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. I also wanted to show you this, this image of the Las Vegas Convention Center where there were large meetings that were held by Latter-day Saints on a regional level. And, and also note that during this time period we've been talking about 
we have businesses that are growing. One early one was MJ Christensen Jewelers and a Latter-day Saint local newspaper, The Beehive, promoted the different Latter-day Saint businesses and also helped with political inserts. And by the time of 1994, their readership was about 75,000. In the mid to late 20th century, we also have people such as the famous Howard Hughes that was working with Latter-day Saints. Uh, we know he spent four years in Vegas. And according to a man that Hughes worked with for three decades, he said, Hughes said, I think the Mormons have the most integrity of any group of the country. They take care of their own people and they won't accept help from charity or the government. And I like, and I like, they don't drink liquor. You can trust them. Other Latter-day Saints who were uh, in the mid 20th century were Perry Thomas, an influential banker. Here you see a, a photo here with Wayne Newton and Frank Farenkopf that's again in the collections. A person that helped to keep the mob in line during this period was Sheriff Ralph Lamb, also a, a Latter-day Saint. And although Perry and Lamb were not in uh, church each Sunday, they had deep roots from their childhood and brought principles of integrity into the marketplace for which they were known. Sheriff Lamb, a tough Alamo cowboy, kept the mob in check during the decades of the 60s and 70s, and also once ran the motorcycle gang known as the Hells Angels out of town. Though he was a Latter-day Saint, he had his own way of doing things, his own style. Lamb, referring to his 18-year record as sheriff, said, quote, we never had one problem with gangsters here. You never heard the name of T Tony Spilatro in a newspaper while I was sheriff. I'm not bragging about that. I'm just telling you. About this time, we also have the launch of the Las Vegas Mission, created in 1975. And in 1997, the Las Vegas West Mission was created, <clears throat> which the dividing line being I-15. Just last week, I took a picture of these missionaries at the Floyd Lamb Park, also a, a brother to Ralph Lamb and, and a uh, Latter-day Saint where they were there talking to people in the park. The following year, we had the, US, the USA Bicentennial celebration and Latter-day Saint Lila Zona was selected to be the person that would uh, lead that uh, group for the celebration. Here's a picture of her giving the, all of the things she had collected uh, from the Bicentennial to UNLV. Now I wanna switch gears and say something about outside observations of Vegas that have been going on for decades and that I've noticed myself in doing research the past year. For example, Nevada State Archivist Guy Louis Roca explained what he encountered after leaving his Las Vegas home to attend Eastern University. Students there ask questions like this, you live in Vegas? You're kidding. People don't live there, they go there. Where do you, where do you live, in a hotel? The only image of town was one long strip of casinos, hotels and motels and mobsters running amok. I found out in about 100 interviews I've conducted this past year, one with Mayor Carolyn Goodman, that there are people that feel like many people, that Vegas is a great place to live. And in her interview, she talked about how faith was improving the areas. I note, she said, we now have the nonprofits and our faith-based leaders, all of them working together to create the harmony and a beautiful place of living, which we who live here love. The Sodom and Gomorrah Sin City, that's not us. and might have been back when it was be being created but the reality, the good far outweighs any of the negatives and it's, and it's beautiful to see how the different faiths are united. One of the people that I've really enjoyed interacting here along with Sue Kim and Peter and others is Clay T. D. White, who is the inaugural director of the Oral History Research Center at UNLV that is exceptional. Clay, Clay T. explained that Spiritual life 
in Las Vegas is very important to the people who live here. Another person that I visited with is Latter-day Saint Heidi Gresham Wixom, a middle school teacher and community activist who led an effort to clean up loot billboards in the Vegas area. She stated, <clears throat> as cited in the RJ, we shouldn't be forced to throw a quarter on the floor when we pass a billboard and want our kids to divert their eyes. 99% of the billboards are decent. It's the 1% that's not exemplary. People forget this is not just a tourist attraction. We are home to a million and a half people where we live and drive and take our children. So she led a successful effort to clean up the billboards. Howard Bullock, a very prominent businessman in Vegas, talked about how Vegas was a great place to raise kids. And I heard this over and over again from people of varied face. <clears throat> he notes this is a wonderful place to raise children. The reason why is because our children see the black and the white. He noted where sin abounds, grace abounds more. Bullock's also made the point that in this mixed environment, the Latter-day Saint week, week Day Youth Religion Program Seminary really makes an impact on their lives. One volunteer seminary teacher was Mary Beth Scow, who was also the uh, 2009 Nevada Mother of the Year and was heavily involved as a count on the county commission and as an educator. Scow recalled, I taught seminary for eight years while I was on the school board. Such a wonderful experience. I would always tell my students what you're learning here is fortifying you to go over to that high school and, and to be able to face the things you're going to hear, the things you're going to see. She notes, I had an experience one time with our principal at the high school. He said, sometimes I come out to watch your kids come over here because they are light to my school. They're coming from class from an early morning, say 6, 6.30 in the morning and going over to the high school uh, to begin their regular secular education for the day. One of the supervisors of seminary at Shadow Ridge is Tammy Stout. She also concurred that the administrators, she notes, have commented to us on numerous occasions that when our seminary is dismissed and as they're walking over one block to the high school, they'll get on the radio and say, do you feel it? And they will say, yes, they're on their way, meaning they can feel the goodness of these seminary students as they walk into that campus that that has been commented back to us on multiple occasions of just the caliber of these students and the good spirit that they bring. One of the teachers at Shadow Ridge that I interviewed, Paige Smith, a Catholic, a 17 year veteran teacher there said, when Shadow Ridge first opened, the church wasn't built yet. So they had seminary in my classroom. I think having seminary before school was great for the kids because they get a little bit of that moral compass and especially in the morning. She went on to say, a lot of times the Latter-day Saint kids, they were involved in student council, which puts on the assemblies, dances, and they're kind of the driving force. I know that others look to them as leaders and as role models. Current North, North Las Vegas Mayor John Lee observed as a non-member of the Latter-day Saint faith when he was in high school, he said, <clears throat> they they were usually, speaking of Latter-day Saints, the smartest clubs in the smartest clubs. They were elected to things, and the rest of it just kind of followed along. We knew dang well they should be the president of the school because they would just do the job instead of just goofing around. So they held a lot of positions of leadership in the school. One of the people that I really enjoyed uh, interviewing along with He noted that at the high school level, many of the leaders were members of the church. Many of them were class presidents and student body presidents, and he even remembered them some 60 years later by name. One of the things that I was impressed with doing this research, I came down to Vegas in April on one trip, and I heard the Latter-day Saint Zion's Youth Symphony and Choir, um, that this wonderful group of kids that are 
high school age 14 to 18, who joined under the direction of the founders, Carolyn Taylor and Jenny Jackson, and um, are able to perform this beautiful, inspiring music for others. As far as education is concerned, I did a little math and I found out I was surprised to find there are 33 schools in Clark County named after Latter-day Saints. You can see the names of those I don't have time to go into, but I thought that this was an interesting fact. I also noticed uh, the Reed Whipple Cultural Arts Center that I've been reading about and learned more about Whipple, how he was very involved, not only in his church, as a Latter-day Saint, but as an area scout leader and president of the Lions Club. And of uh, the fact that when the city purchased this church building, they named it the Reed Whipple Cultural Center in his honor. A very distinguished gentleman and uh, lady that I recently met before the, his passing was Lloyd, Judge Lloyd and Laprille George, who have certainly left their mark on Vegas as noted here with the uh, U.S. courthouse being named, the federal courthouse being named after Judge George that recently passed away. So we have these wonderful buildings that are named after influential people. As far as entertainment, as we go into the, the final uh, fourth quarter of this presentation, we have uh, Donnie and Marie Osmond. I had the good fortune of interviewing them delightful people. They, they, they performed in Vegas, a running show for a dozen years, and were rated a number one show three times during that time period. Of course, we cannot uh, neglect Latter-day Saint convert Gladys Knight, who is a Motown legend. Since 67, she continues to perform in the Vegas region and has a home in Henderson. And I might also just say that, you know, again, talking about diversity, rock and roller Brandon Flowers is also a Latter-day Saint family man. He was quoted several years ago as saying, I don't go to church because I got nothing better to do on Sundays. I really believe it. As it notes here, killer star Brandon Flowers told CBS News, I don't know what my life would be like without it. I think I would have been a, casu a casualty of rock and roll. Switching now to the political arena, um, my interview with Mark Hutchison, former state senator and lieutenant governor of Nevada, um, I learned that one of the keys, I wondered why there were so many Latter-day Saints elected is because he said we'd run for office and there was effective networking. I think of a number of people that have mentioned the names of Judy Brailsford or Joyce Haldeman, who's been a great resource to me with setting up interviews that have really been behind the lines campaigning for successful, not only successful uh, Latter-day Saint campa um, cam campaigns, but others that have likewise uh, good values, helping them to be elected for the sake of the community. Hutchinson said, Latter-day Saints have natural grassroots networks and resources available to them because they have they have people who embrace the same values that they have that, that they are running on. Latter-day Saints say, "Come embrace my candidacy because you embrace my values." Those are reasons why Latter-day Saints are probably disproportionately engaged in and successful in elected politics in Southern Nevada. You can just see here a, a wide list of. Um, I just gave this as a sampling of various people that have been elected in various areas. And, uh, you know, I get on the road and, and 215 going east or west, and I think of my interview with Bruce Woodbury. I think of the papers of James Seastrand, who's had such an impact in this area, and interviewing Harry Reid and Mary Beth Scow and uh, Ray Ross and, and Mayor Lee and others that are noted here. Of course, Senator Harry Reid uh, has served in the served in, this, in the U.S. Senate for uh, several decades. Some of the former Clark County Commissioners Jay Bingham and Bruce Woodbury here have offered great leadership. 
here's another, uh, here's a picture of James C. Strand and, and his good wife, Roselle, who also was a 1996 Nevada Mother of the Year. One uh, local Latter-day Saint, uh, Christy Bullock, has been involved with the American Mothers Association and uh, heavily for the last decade or two in helping with that area. The current mayor of uh, North Las Vegas, John J. Lee, I've enjoyed interviewing and, and learning more about the community, as well as Mo Dennis, a current state senator. And recently, former Henderson mayor, current uh, Clark County Commissioner and Vice Chair Jim Gibson sent an email uh, at my request uh, about Latter-day Saint influence, noting the Latter-day Saint community has always been active in Las Vegas because they sincerely care about their community. With their committed involvement, they count on their voices being heard to have influences on decisions made at every level. As an elected government official, I know I can count on their input on policy issues, land use issues, and more, because they truly care about their neighborhoods and community as a whole. Now, shifting gears, this was, I mentioned, I wanted to go from the old Mormon Fourth to the Las Vegas Temple. This was a very important um, uh, piece of history for Latter-day Saints in this region. And I was amazed that nearly 300,000 people toured the temple from varied faiths uh, during the last three weeks of the year in 1989, before it was dedicated in December. Tom Thomas, son of famed Las Vegas baker Perry Thomas observed when the announcement came out, what I remember was a great deal of support from all the other faiths. And I believe that the building of a temple in Las Vegas to members of other faiths was a bookmark. That's a good place. This is a community. There are families that are here. And now the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints is going to build a temple here. Through the papers of Jim Seastrand, who served as point man at this time with the temple committee, there's some wonderful, wonderful um, observations about the temple and the people uh, from those that pass through of the Jewish faith or Protestant faith and uh, a variety of people and world religions talking about how they were touched at that time of going through the open house before it was dedicated. Local Latter-day Saint Ashley Hall, who served for years in the city, um, mentioned as a, a volunteer working at the temple, so he had been a city manager, as you know, for many, many years. He said, I've had people come in that front door of the temple, non-members who would say, why does this temple shine? I mean, I live down the hill a little way and I find myself on the back patio and I look up at this glow around the temple. It doesn't have lights on. It does at night, but, but not in the daytime. I wanted to mention that within just one week of the opening of the Las Vegas uh, Temple for the Church of Jesus Christ Latter-day Saints, the Mirage opened at a cost of $1 billion. And I found an interesting editorial by John Ryan, journalist for the Las Vegas Sun at this time, who toured the Latter-day Saint Las Vegas Temple days before the dedication. He wrote, Quote, there are two new structures in Las Vegas. One, the Mirage is indeed an impressive building. But for graceful beauty, there is the Las Vegas Nevada Temple. There you are transported to another world apart from the frenzied Las Vegas life. Now we have a great temple to share pride with its members. And here's a, a beautiful image my colleague Martin Anderson took. We're co-producing a uh, documentary on, uh, with the title of Bright Lights, and uh, that will be a companion to the book I'm writing, Bright Lights in the Desert, the Latter-day Saints of Las Vegas. Before we wrap up, I just want to mention there's a number of service projects that have been going on for a long time here with Latter-day Saints and often holding hands with members of other faiths to do good things in the community. I was very touched with a newspaper article that led to many interviews with the Greater Evergreen Missionary Baptist Church and also Latter-day Saints um, because of their church burning down in 1983 and Latter-day Saints coming to help rebuild it. 
Charles Johnson, stake president on the left here, and on the right, Terry Johnson, and the local minister of the Evergreen Baptist Church are here uh, with uh, much joy as they completed this project. Later, I wanted you to note that the, the minister of the Evergreen Missionary Baptist Church, this wonderful African-American man, came down and when there was a, bit of, a little bit of scuttle about the traffic that might be a problem with the Las Vegas Temple at a board meeting in, in the city, he stood up for the Latter-day Saints as the Latter-day Saints had helped him. We also know the Saints helped with an, uh, the uh, flood of 1999, you know, along with other good people in the community. Now, as we wrap things up in the final two minutes here, I want to quote two local journalists that I've interviewed. Well-known Las Vegas journalists John Ralston and John L. Smith described the Latter-day Saint impact on their community. Ralston observed, their influence has been pervasive because it's been so broad and so deep. They were known for standing up, men of moral rectitude. John L. Smith added, you cannot say that Las Vegas would be anywhere near what it is today without that tremendous influence of some very dedicated people who happen to be Mormon in faith and practice. I don't think there's an area of Las Vegas life that has not been touched by the LDS faith, participating and organizing in the community, focusing on public education values that are so important to a community if you're going to be put down roots. I think the greatest contribution is stability, to have members of the community that are stabilizing influence influencers cannot be stated. It's so important. And finally, Senator Bryan on Latter-day Saint Influence said, Richard Bryan, the LDS community has had a profound impact on Southern Nevada, dating back to the early founding of the mission in 1855 here in Las Vegas and the growth of the community largely in the early days. They brought with them strong fam family values. They brought with them the virtue of hard work, discipline, all of which is part of the value system. But always it was family. Family was first, not second, not third. And the family structure impresses all. We don't understand necessarily the theological roots to the belief, but the family values, the civic responsibility. In effect, they're good people who help us to make Las Vegas a good city for all of us to live in. And so Latter-day Saint contributions to Las Vegas Milu demonstrate the symbiotic relationship forged between a conservative sect and a vibrant ecumenical community. Along with many other faith-based peoples of various cultures and denominations, well over 100,000 local members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints have helped bring family values, morality, community service, wholesomeness, and stability to the Las Vegas environment. Though they represent only about 6% of the population, they are among the most influential citizens and certainly a part of the fabric which makes Las Vegas a great place to live. And again, I wanted to just put the credits and thank these folks that have helped. And thank you so much for listening. I'll now to take questions, which you'll need to um, just put in chat. And I will, won't have time with, um, I think there's about 168 people listening to go through um, maybe all the questions there might be, but I'll pick and choose as I can. So I think I'll stop the sharing. Okay. Okay. Okay, so can you hear me okay? Yeah? All right. These are very small and I had to put my glasses on. <laughs> um, if, you're not, if you're not finished compiling biographies for Great Latter-day Saints of Las Vegas, may I suggest the biography of Shannon Bybee? Okay, thank you. I'm just reading as they pop up. Um, others have given good information. Uh, not a question, but, but thank you so much. Very interesting. Thank you. Uh, 
Thank you. So I'm looking at, I'm not seeing questions, I'm seeing comments. And I'm grateful that uh, I don't feel like I'm being stoned, which I didn't think I would. And I'm seeing friends in the audience like Clay T. White and Christy Bullock and uh, others. And so thank you for taking your time. I know we're busy people and just appreciate you uh, tuning in. And uh, okay, what has surprised you the most in learning about Las Vegas? I don't know if this is so much of a surprise because I mentioned my friends, the Dixons, that I've known for 40 years. Um, one on Saturdays, we, my wife and I have been living here for uh, a little over a month. We take these little uh, trips on Saturdays. So many wonderful things 30 minutes away. And I get help from uh, friends here in the library of where to go. So that's been one thing that I wasn't aware of, of how many things are so close. The other thing has been, um, in just conducting the interviews, I've really in loved um, my friends of different faiths and cultures. I've just, the beauty of the people. I, I love the people of Las Vegas, and I'm not just talking about Latter-day Saints, but I just appreciate, um, it's been a wonderful experience for me, dealing whether it's politicians or journalists or academics are folks that are just trying to raise their kids. And it's been just a marvelous experience for my wife and I. So we're coming away with just uh, gratitude for good people. Um, okay, one question, has there been a significant increase or decrease in Las Vegas and La in Latter-day Saints over time? I'd love to tell you it was increasing, okay? I should tell you just as a personal note, when I mentioned I was from Southern California, I wasn't raised a Latter-day Saint. My father was uh, Seventh-day Adventist. My mother was Church of Christ, my sister Baptist. And so we had a lot of stuff going on. I did not become a Latter-day Saint until I was um, just turning 20 years old. So just as a background for me. And um, it's interesting, Southern Cal and Salt Lake City are quite different. And Vegas is kind of an in-between with all these wonderful people. but. I would have to say that going back to, uh, you know, when I mentioned it was 10% at uh, 1960, I would say it's gone down a little bit as I was saying that the state of Nevada now has 339 congregations as a whole. It's 6% of the population. I don't have the exact amount, but I know there's 27 stakes times four would make 108,000 that the, the, the situation is Vegas just keeps getting bigger and bigger. A lot of people I think are coming in from California that uh, oh, a couple of interviews said that has something to do with not paying taxes. I don't know if that's correct or not, but it's going down a little bit, but uh, I see the missionaries still out there wanting to talk to people. But uh, so, yeah, I'm just looking and the growth of LDS members in Las Vegas due to members moving here from other states are due to converts who have joined more recently? I would say that's a combination of both. And that's a very good question. And I need to look at that a bit closer. So uh, up, I will tell you up until 3 p.m. today, I, I felt like an Egyptian temple, never complete and always under construction. And I'm still collecting data. And I love the archives here. You've got to, you've got to come down to the lead library, get over to special collections, and they have some wonderful treasures. I've just shared a few with you, but on a number of topics. Um, so anyway, that's just a, uh, a few thoughts about that. I'm going through these que questions uh, carefully. Okay, so these are just things uh, that are not necessarily questions, but... Um, these are good things, so thank you. Do you believe that Nevada would not, here's one question, now it just moved down. Do you believe Nevada would not have become a state and thrives then without Mormon influence? I think there's so many great people in Nevada that I have to say, I think it would have thrived, but I think the Latter-day Saints helped in their degree to help it to be a better place. But um, that's why I mentioned at the outset, I didn't want to say the Latter-day Saints were the only ones, but, but part of the fabric. I've met too many people of different faiths to know that uh, they're not the only ones, but they, they're an inclusive group that wants to be part of the community and make it a better place like you folks do. 
So I think that uh, we are now at the time. So Sue Kim, I'm gonna turn it back to you. I think I've handled the questions. I again wanna just say thank you so much to the lead library. Thank you to the staff that have treated me so well and especially Sue Kim, thank you. And um, I just enjoyed being with you today. I'm grateful for the technology that allows us to meet in these unusual circumstances. So thank you so much. So speaking of uh, technology, we wanna uh, send a big shout out to our colleague, Key Choi, for helping us with the virtual meeting. He was essential to this. So thank you, Key, for keeping us on track and making us not have a nervous breakdown. And uh, so I wanted to you know, I know that uh, Dr. Woods was not able to get to all of the questions, but I'm sending out right now in the chat his email. So if you have questions, you can definitely send those to him. Um, and I, as I mentioned in the earlier part of the presentation, this is being recorded. So we will soon have this uh, uh, a recording available. Um, I will likely, it will likely be on the link to uh, uh, the Special Collections website, um, or, uh, so uh, you can look for that um, uh, in the coming days. So thank you so much. And thank you, Dr. Wood. It's been great thank you so you much. Here. Thank you.